As you'll soon discover, Fiona Campbell is quietly and calmly spoken and quite happy to stay out of the limelight. But when it comes to being a true influencer, Fiona is a giant. I know that she's highly respected by her colleagues and peers, but I suspect that even those who might be trying to block her progress and some of her ideas also develop a grudging respect for the tenacity and sharp strategy that hides beneath her quiet, calm exterior. Fiona, thanks for coming on Influences. A pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Phil. You're welcome. Now, you've always struck me as a very methodical type of person. I believe you had a computer programming background, is that correct? Yes, that's right. For, uh, for about 20 years, I was a mainframe programmer, mostly in the finance industry, programming in COBOL and natural. So, yeah, methodical and, and logic was, was my thing. Very good. That sounds very heavy to me. And, and did you also live in the UK for a while? Yeah, for a few years, I, w I had a couple of programming jobs in um, the south of England and then in London. And I guess it was the experience of living there for a few years. And I didn't call myself a cyclist, but I used a bike to get around locally, just little bits, and um, got used to that. And I was coming back from England to hear that... I guess I saw the big contrast in conditions and driver behaviour. That's exactly what I was wondering, whether your UK experience had any influence on you and um, what you ended up doing. Yeah, I think a lot of people who are active in the cycling area, when when I speak to them, they've lived somewhere else where it's better and it's it's <laughs> the contrast that motivates um, wanting to help change things. Yeah, absolutely. And so when did you actually, you grew up in Sydney, did you? Yep, grew up in Sydney, um, leafy sort of northwestern suburbs, a um, bit of bush. And um, yeah, I, I did ride to school one time when I was 16 on, on one day after I'd spent the, the Christmas holidays with a friend who liked riding and we'd ridden a bit over the holidays and on my first day back at school in year 11 I I rode to school but it was a convent school and the nuns right. told me that I was never ever to do it again it was most <laughs> unladylike <laughs> so I don't know whether whether that has um been part of what's made me determined as well yeah. <laughs> don't ever tell Fiona not to do something hey Exactly. <laughs> so it wasn't the traffic that was a problem. It was um, something else. I, uh, yeah. I mean, when I came back from England, it was, it was the, the traffic. It was the driver behaviour and the condition of the roads. The roads were shocking. There were no facilities. But in London, where I was living, there wasn't really any infrastructure either. But at least the drivers are polite. And... Um, the contrast for me was obvious with um, the body language of drivers. You know, if if a if an Australian if, if a London driver flashes their headlights at you, it means be my best, be my guest, come in, come in ahead yeah. of me at the intersection. Yeah. Um, and in Australia, it means get the out of my way before yeah. I run you over. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now I'd love to include a photo with this. A video of you riding with your Jack Russells. So how long have they been your riding companions? Um, for nine years now, when Goodness. we got um, Cody and his mother um, arrived. Cody as a, as a nine-week-old puppy. Right. And um, yeah, it didn't take long before we, we put them into cargo bikes and started getting them used to it. The, the mother, Dollar, was um, a bit reluctant at first. Um, right. But they just absolutely love it and you know if I say trikies um, or sort of head towards the garage they're they're out there and waiting um, <laughs> but the previous previous dogs we had were the same right they also love it. so dogs like riding and do the dogs have a favorite ride do they tell you of their preferred route by any chance they anywhere where we can stop at a park on the way and they can run alongside the bike for a while ah 
you did quite a few years of work voluntarily uh, before you actually moved and got your position at, or a initial position at the city of Sydney. So um, how does it compare, if you like, working on the inside to working on the outside? I mean, there are frustrations always, but it's much better on the inside because I can really dedicate myself the whole time to, to my mission of making Sydney bike friendly. So, yeah, I mean, when I, was, I was working full time in computer programming, but it was, you know, by night that I was doing bicycle advocacy work. And, um, you know, I was on the executive of the Cycling Promotion Alliance. I was for a while the vice president of the Bicycle Federation of Australia. I was active in a couple of local bike groups. Um, I was writing submissions for Bicycle New South Wales and I was the cycling representative on the um, Australian Bicycle Council and also on the National Road Safety Strategy Panel. And I was also for five years um, a director on the Pedestrian Council of Australia board. Um, so what did you do in your spare time, Fiona? <laughs> Um, I was very lucky to have an understanding family and supportive husband who um, put up with all my my advocacy work, um, but basically nothing else. So what years are we talking roughly from and to, say from when you returned from the UK until you, yeah. you know, so got was, the full-time um, role? Yeah, uh, 10 years. So it was from um, February 1998 was when I joined Bicycle New South Wales, my local bicycle group and started going to critical mass rides and it was 2008 that I got the job at the city of Sydney. Okay so looking at that 10-year voluntary career if you like and I know you've still done other voluntary things since but just focusing on that particular era uh, what would you say were some of your biggest wins? Um, one of them was getting Marrick for Council to reinstate the bike budget. Um, so Marrick for Council had, had a bike budget, a piddling little bike budget. And, and this, the year that I'm thinking of, which was the year 2000, they'd published the draft budget and it had an amount of $20,000, which is, you know, enough to build a curb ramp or something, you know, not anything much. And um, so Bike Marrickville, um, we organised um, a bit of our campaign and got a whole lot of people to write in because by law, by Local Government Act, councils have to take into account any submissions that they get on the draft budget. And it turns out, you know, we wrote more submissions than anyone else put together. Um, and so there was pressure on them to, to reinstate the bike budget. And I... Um, spoke at the council meeting where they were considering the draft budget and spoke about the benefits of cycling and how they, you know, needed to to allocate budget towards it. And um, the decision was that to cancel it was overturned. So the, the mayor, Barry Cotter, was trying to get it um, cancelled completely, taken out that 20000 completely. And we got that overturned and, and the bike budget, piddling as it was, kept. Um, the following evening, I was at the council chambers for um, another meeting and um, the mayor, Barry Cotter, saw me there and started yelling at me and screaming at me that I was lying to the councillors. My speech was all, you know, totally fact-checked and all accurate um, and that I was stacking meetings, maybe because, you know, there were some friends who'd come along to sit in the gallery while I gave the speech, but... Um, yeah, so uh, he brought me to tears and um, that was my first experience of sort of political bullying. Um, but yeah, it, again, it didn't stop me. It only makes me more determined um, when I meet resistance to, to make the change. So that was and one. How, we how also... long did it take until Marrickville Council's budget increased above $20,000 once you saved the budget line still being in there? Yeah, the next year it was higher. It was, I think, 50,000 and then stayed sort of gradually increasing over time. And then um, when the three councils merged into Inner West Council, it was Marrickville who was by then well ahead and had a few cycleway projects underway, uh, which are being delivered now, which is just warms my heart to, to ride along one of those every morning now. 
And the mayor, is he still the mayor or has he moved no. on? <laughs> no, I don't know what he's doing now. I had been, um, I and the others in Bike Sydney had been lobbying for them to do a bike plan. And um, this was at the time when it had just, um, the, it had just merged with South Sydney Council. Uh, Lucy Turnbull was was the Lord Mayor, and I'd been lobbying for them to to do a bike plan. And we'd finally heard from an inside source that they had started working on a bike plan, but they hadn't told us that that, that was the case. We suspected it probably wouldn't be terribly well done. And my meeting with the Lord Mayor sort of was unsuccessful at, at getting much of anything really. Um, but we'd heard that they were having a big event in the town hall um, called Greening Sydney. It turned out it was about green buildings, green walls, green roofs. Um, so, you know, it was not something that we could really infiltrate usefully. So what I did was I got a friend who was a designer to design up a little lapel sticker um, with a picture of a bike in the middle and greening Sydney written above and, and below the bike. And I coloured each one in by hand with a green highlighter. We had a couple of hundred of them and we stood on the town hall steps. And as people came in, we said, do you want to show support for the city who's we hear is doing a bike plan? You know, you can show your support with this lapel, lapel badge. And almost every single person that we spoke to willingly put it on, um, including the governor of New South Wales, Murray Bashir. And um, so the Lord Mayor, Lucy Turnbull, who was hosting that, every person that she spoke to almost during that event or shake, shook hands with would have been wearing a little bicycle badge on, on their lapel. So um, I was pretty happy with that as a way of trying to show, you know, despite all our efforts not, not coming to anything at that point, um, to show that there was strong community support. Wow. That is a really interesting piece, dare I say, ambush marketing. Um, very, very interesting. So in summary of, of that volunteer era, uh, if, you, if someone watching this is involved in a local club or bug or whatever sort of organisation, um, what tips would you have, like if you had to give just you know, a couple of tips on you know, what strategies or the 101s that they really should be doing? What would you say? Yeah. Think carefully about what it is you want to achieve and line everything up with that. And then think about who are your allies and who are the unlikely allies that you might be able to draw in to help you to influence the people who make the decision. Okay. Um, anything else if I dig a little deeper? I've actually written um, a bit of a guide about how to do advocacy projects some a long time ago. Um, so maybe if people are interested in more, maybe um, get in contact and I can, I can well, share that. Well, if we could link that to the notes with this YouTube, that would be very, very good, very much appreciated. So let's move on to your career at the City of Sydney. So when did you join and what was your original role? So I joined in March 2008, um, but I, I didn't get the job at first. So Bike Sydney had been lobbying for the bike plan. Um, and in 2006, uh, the draft bike plan was exhibited and Bike Sydney was lobbying to try and make sure that council also hired a bike planner because we found it so difficult to try and find out who was the right person we needed to talk to about this project or that project or this different issue. Um, and we wanted someone, a central point of contact that we could hold accountable um, and be the primary harassment point for us. Um, so we wanted council to hold uh, to hire a bike planner. And the initially the general manager at the time said that that was never gonna happen. Um, but by the time the bike plan was adopted by council, we'd managed to get that incorporated into the into the bike plan as one of the actions. Um, and then the council advertised for the role. So I remember sending the advertisement around um, to all the people that I knew that worked in the field saying, you know, we, we need to get someone really good for this role. And um, my my good friend Vera, who worked for Leichhardt Council and did most of the, the bike activities there she emailed me back and said 
but if you look at the job description, it's everything that you're already doing on a volunteer basis. Why don't you apply? And I'm like, no, I'm a, I'm a computer program. I could never apply. I don't have any local government experience. I'm, I don't have any engineering or transport planning qualifications. But she pushed me and convinced me to apply. And um, in the end, there were three people shortlisted for the job. One of them was Vera. Um, one of them was me. And then a third person who I didn't know at the time. And um, Vera told me that she did really badly in the interview because she was determined that I should get the job. She wanted me to get it. <laughs> um, but in the end, it was the third person who, who got the job um, and should have got the job. She had um, great experience doing a very similar role for another council and um, was ideal for the role. So she got the job and... Um, my husband Paul said, "You know, you, sh you shouldn't help her. You shouldn't work with her. You know, she, you, that job should have been yours." And I'm like, "Of course, <laughs> I'm going to help. You know, it's, it's. Yeah. Um, I want to achieve a better Sydney." And um, anyway, we became friends. But after six months, she was poached back by the council where she'd previously worked, and so the role became vacant. And um, I quickly put up my hand and called the director and said, "You know." I'm still here <laughs> um, and keen. And um, I think it was, a, it was a difficult decision, a challenging decision for them to make because I had been a vocal critic from the outside. I'd been harassing people mercilessly about projects that weren't good enough for cycling. Should they and, allow um, the barbarians inside the tent? Well... Is it better to have me on the inside or the outside, really, is what it <laughs> comes down to. <laughs> um, mm. And so uh, they, they checked with various people that, you know, project managers and the road safety officer who, you know, I had been in regular contact with for a long time. Um, and they all supported me being employed. So, yeah, I, um, I got the job that is my dream job, as it turns out. And every day since then has been fantastic it's it's full of challenges I'm doing different things all the time learning so much and able to make a real difference to Sydney so hard to imagine but correct me if I'm wrong that role was the first full-time role specifically in this area and now you head I don't know whether you call it an office department division but you've had quite a team at different times uh, working under your supervision, correct? Yeah. So I started off as transport planner, brackets, cycling. Um, but after a year or two, um, my manager at the time said that the role needed to be, um, what do you call it, upgraded because I needed to have more um, ability to discuss things at higher levels in other areas of council to make sure that the strategy was being implemented. Um, so I uh, became manager of cycling, uh, manager of cycling strategy. And I currently have a team of five. Um, before COVID, it was 10. And that that team was brought together when um, we were building quite a lot of cycleways in the early days. We were building Burke Street, the ones in Alexandria, uh, Union Street and College Street and Kent Street, I think, all at the same time in in around 2010. And there was huge media opposition. There was outcry. There was Alan Jones calling for a rally at Town Hall for people to oppose the building of cycleways. And um, the CEO brought together a team, the Cycling Hot team, where we would have the multidisciplinary team sitting all together so the media person, the marketing person, the um, behaviour change and the planning all together so that we could really make sure we worked closely together and, you know, got through the, the, the challenging times that we had. Mm. You mentioned briefly the Burke Street Protected Cycleway, which people might not remember the extraordinary concerted um, campaign between the Daily Telegraph and the um, Alan Jones for people outside New South Wales watching this, just insert the name of your equivalent shock jock, if you like, in your state. 
um, it really was quite a firestorm at the time. And, and did the sky actually fall down? I can't remember. What actually happened in the end? No, such a successful project in the end. Um, but it was it was interesting. When, when I first started, the consultation was starting for the project and we had public meetings for people to come to and people spoke so strongly against the cycleway that it would be, you know, a, a total disaster. And the amount of correspondence that was coming in to the Lord Mayor and to the council um, <clears throat> talking about, yeah, how bad the project was, I, I must admit I, I even had second thoughts myself, you know, maybe we're doing the wrong project in the wrong place. And um, what we did was we went and door knocked the people who lived along Burke Street. And it was a real eye opener because from the correspondence, it looked like everyone opposed the project. But when we went and door knocked and spoke to people individually, um, almost everyone I spoke to was either ambivalent, didn't mind at all, or supportive of the project. But those people don't write. They're not vocal and, and contacting the media. So you only ever hear from the people who are opposed to projects generally. And um, I was just blown away by the level of support or ambivalence that there was for the project. Um, and in the end, the project was done and the results are fabulous. And nobody on Burke Street now would say that the cycleway should be removed. It's a beautiful, integral part of the street. Um, I remember reading a letter from someone who lived on Burke Street who said, you know, I don't ride a bike and I never will, but Burke Street is now such a pleasant place to, to walk. Um, so, yeah, it's it's the traffic is calmer because the road is narrower. That means it's easier for someone, a resident, who parks on the other side of the street to be able to cross the road. Um, it's quieter. It's just a beautiful street. Beautiful street. Yes. And indeed, and real estate values have gone up and the businesses Absolutely. have boomed and on it goes. I Just for the mm. benefit of those who don't live in or near the city of Sydney local government area itself, I just did a bit of research and it's one of the, actually one of the smallest local governments in area and only the 15th largest in Australia by population, 242,000 at last count. But it has another half a million or so that visit and work there each day for shopping or whatever it might be. But it's actually one of the wealthiest councils in Australia. And it's got a budget approaching a billion dollars a year now and $12 billion in assets. So small geographically, but you know, really one of the largest and most powerful councils in Australia. So given that you're in charge of that particular division within the council, um, do, do, you, do you feel more constrained or empowered now that you're working with such a major government organisation? Oh, definitely empowered. Um, and, I mean, for that, really, I have to thank the, the CEO and the whole organisation um, as well as the councillors and Lord Mayor, you know, like everyone is so supportive of the goals because it makes so much sense. It's not an ideological thing. Um, you know, you said it's a small council, but it's a crucial of crucial importance economically. And, for example, businesses, um, businesses want to locate their headquarters, you know, Google or any other one, um, where it's a nice place to live and it's easy to get around and for it to be easy to get around you need to not have the whole place car dependent you need to have good public transport and easy access for walking and cycling and that makes it a place that that makes it a place that attracts companies that's what businesses want and we can see that because for example just over a four-year period um, in the city centre businesses invested $57 million in end-of-trip facilities, not because they had to. These were They were retrofitting, not because of council regulations, but actually retrofitting um, their existing buildings. So I $57 just to million dollars over four years. end-of-trip facilities is actually a bit of geeky jargon. What do you mean by yeah. end-of-trip facilities, Fiona? Yeah. So bike parking, showers, lockers, 
um, change rooms, that, that sort of thing. Okay. So providing for their employees to be able to ride to work and then shower and change and park their bikes securely. Um, so, that, I mean, that's more than the state government was investing in that area. And it shows that employers are keen to make sure that their staff can take a healthy option to work. So while you know, we're talking money, how, how much mm-hmm. is the City of Sydney investing each year in cycling infrastructure these days? Has it gone um, up, gone down? Yeah, it, it was $11 million a year on average. I haven't actually looked at what this current year is. It would be a lot more than that. Um, and now we've got, just in the last few years, the state government has been uh, funding a lot of our cycleway construction as well so that's enabled us to increase the amount as well okay so the rate of progress you'd say is increasing what from what you're saying definitely uh yes we've over the first 10 years we built 15 kilometers of separated cycleway so about one and a half kilometers a year and then in 2020 including the pop-ups we did nine kilometers in the one year so now we're going back and, and making some of those pop-ups uh, uh, permanent, but it's we've, we've now really increased the, the pace of projects. At the moment, we have five projects, cycleway projects under construction, um, a few in the city centre, Pitt Street North making that permanent, King Street between Pitt and Phillips Street is under construction, will be finished in a month or two, College Street, just started construction, building that back after it was removed in the past, um, and then a, a number of other projects in Erskineville and Alexandria area. Okay, and what's the timing on the much uh, vaunted Oxford Street project, which is a major yeah. arterial? Yep, so that'll start construction in one year's time, just after World Pride is finished, the um, Mardi Gras, the international Mardi Gras, right. uh, because that will be in Sydney, and that will take about a year to, just under a year to build. Okay. So anyone watching this who's either working within local government anywhere in Australia or perhaps overseas and wants to try or they might once again be trying to influence local government to help move them forward, but particularly those working inside like you do now, now that you've had a long period as an insider, what would be your advice of how they could help nudge things along in a favourable direction? I guess two things. One is the the challenge that you have of decision makers, supporting decision makers to go ahead with projects when there's some opposition. And there's always, there are always some people who object to projects and, you know, might be someone who loses the convenience having a parking spot right outside their house instead of having to walk around the corner to one. Um, so, it's really important to do either the door knocking or a proper telephone survey that's representative or something to show decision makers that the level of community support is actually much stronger than the impression that they will get just from the letters they get to make sure that the right decision is made. Um, And the other is to stoke your pipeline um, because that's what's served us really well. In 2018, when we adopted the cycling strategy, the consultation that we did for that um, showed great support among the community for our cycling strategy. But the number one comment we got was that you should do more faster. And so during 2019, um, my good colleague Beth did a huge amount of work looking at all the processes and procedures that we have, you know, both the external ones seeking approval and the internal processes how we do the procurement um, and materials and design, what can we do to build more faster. And as a result of that, we had a lot more projects in the design pipeline where we had concepts already starting to be developed when COVID hit. And that was what enabled us to take the opportunity with COVID uh, when the government said, you know, to as a pandemic response to make sure people can still safely get around we um, want to do some pop-up cycleways. So we had some plans ready to go. And we've since then kept doing that of having lots of design projects in the pipeline so that we have projects ready to go. And, you know, one or two of them will always hit 
a snag or a delay. So that means we've still got other projects that we can continue with. So, yep, get some designs in the pipeline. So community consultation to give political cover and keep that pipeline full because a few might fall by the wayside. Excellent. Yeah. I've got one final question. Oh, sorry, Sorry. go on. The community consultation is a really important part of it, making sure that you take the time to to really talk to all the important stakeholders. You know, if there are key businesses along the route or people have a particular um, interest or need, uh, making sure that you do everything you can to incorporate those. And all the comments that we get from the consultation, the the design manager goes through all those and as much as we can we will um, tweak the design to incorporate people's comments we don't you know decide that if people don't like it we're not going to do it it's Mm. it's not a vote on whether or not the project should go ahead it's we want to hear from people what design tweaks need to be made to make it work well and genuinely being able to make changes to meet people's needs I think is really important for a successful project. Excellent, in, indeed. So let's, um, final question, let's jump in the TARDIS. I don't know if you're a Doctor Who fan or not. Yeah. Yep. But, and we'll go forward in time just 10 years, so we're not going too crazy. And so we hop out in 2032, back in the city of Sydney, and we look around. What changes would you like to be looking at? By then, I think we should have a fairly comprehensive, safe network and that will facilitate anyone who wants to ride to be able to do that and it'll attract people to riding. And by then, I expect we'll have far exceeded our target of 10% of trips to be by bike. Well, this is being recorded, so we'll be able to review this in yep. 10 years' time. And I hope that uh, what you predict is correct. Uh, Fiona Campbell, thanks for being an influencer. Thank you very much, Phil. <laughs>